Hey, um. Let's get started. Um, so some reminders here. Um, we had a homework due last night. Um, um, so I guess that was 3.5. Uh, and um, so we have another homework due Wednesday. This is um, homework 4.2 which I think is about uh, finding um, uh, maxima and minima. And then this one is about, uh, so that's using first derivatives, because that's how you find uh, maxima and minima turning points on the graphs of um, functions. And then homework 4.4, this is about inflection points, which is where we use the second derivative we're going to uh, look at some more examples um, uh, today of that. And uh, I added an extra uh, credit um, uh, assignment there to collect some uh, currency. Uh, so if you bring me your course evaluation, your course evaluation for this course, I, I'm not going to see your course evaluation, but if you bring the because uh, I don't see any of those until after the semester, and they're anonymous in any case. But um, if you bring me uh, uh, the verification that you completed your course evaluation right for this class uh, then, in eServices, then uh, that's worth um, $5, okay? So if you bring me uh, a, you know, a printed receipt that you confirming that you have finished your course evaluation for this particular course, then... Um, um, I will give you some currency for that. We do have one other extra credit assignment that's going to be handed out. Uh, it's not in uh, online. It's not in web assigned, but I'm going to give that one to you on Wednesday um, after we've had a chance to discuss it a little bit more. Okay? Uh, so you have one more um, uh, extra credit opportunity in addition to, of course, the... Um, um, uh, you know, the attendance policy will be going in uh, at the end of the semester uh, if you haven't violated the attendance policy and so forth, right, into building up your, um, uh, building up your currency. Um, so the test review now for test number uh, three is posted. So remember that test date has been postponed. It was supposed to be May the 2nd. That was supposed to be the last class day. Uh, but now the last class day, because of the rain days last week, the last class day will be May the 4th. So you have to come an extra day, okay, on May the 4th, which is uh, next Wednesday, a week from Wednesday. And uh, that's when we'll have test number three. So that has been uh, already, uh, that's already on the Blackboard page, okay. Uh, uh, the um, uh, test review, uh, not, the, not the solutions yet, but the test review. And, of course, as usual, you can bring... You know, your index card to the test. We'll talk more, of course, about the test uh, between now and um, a week from Wednesday. Uh, but that's already uh, posted, okay? Some people were asking about that last time, so that one's there. And then the final exam is um, uh, the following Wednesday. So that will be May the 11th, as, as that was a, 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 always the schedule, um, uh, that the final exam is May the 11th. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention to you is... Um, you have an opportunity in the fall, you guys are all business majors, so you all need to take economics. Uh, uh, and so uh, I think probably uh, you'll be uh, eligible for economics in the fall. Uh, so that's economics 2301 and 2302. You can take those um, in a uh, special format in the fall um, uh, in the, an eight-week format, okay? So you can take uh, the first half of economics uh, in the first eight weeks of the semester. So that would be August 22nd. That's when the fall semester starts, by the way, uh, to uh, that, which is a Monday, uh, to August, uh, October 14th, which is eight weeks. Okay, and then uh, you can take um, uh, Econ 2 uh, in the second eight weeks, which would start the following Monday, October 17th, and then go to the end of the semester. So you can take one or both of these. These are not, uh, one of these is not the prerequisite for the other. So you can take uh, one or both of these in eight-week format 
uh, next fall, okay? And that would include a, uh, uh, in, that, in these sections, you get a cephalo instructor like John, okay? Uh, the one caveat is uh, these eight-week classes are, they're accelerated, so they meet every day, okay? So that would be Monday through Thursday uh, at that time, 10 to 11, 15, okay? So that's a great way to um, uh, knock out uh, your economics requirements for your business major because all business majors have to take both halves of economics here. Um, uh, in the fall, uh, in one uh, uh, semester, okay. And um, it's oh, it's op uh, It says talk to your advisor if you have any questions. You can talk to me. Uh, you did have advisor approval on it last week, but they've lifted the advisor approval, so so you can register for this now, unless you have some other hold <laughs> that's preventing you from registering. Okay, uh, you can register for this now. Um, I would take advantage of that quickly because if you want to, because those classes tend to fill up rapidly all right okay so um, um, keep that option in mind and in general remember registration is open uh, today okay actually for all students so um, uh, you can register for uh, classes um, uh, unless you have some other uh, restriction right uh, you can register for classes uh, 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 any class today okay um, so, so get busy and get registered for the fall semester. You don't want all of the good um, uh, sections and times uh, to get filled up, right, before uh, uh, you get enrolled, right? So you don't want to get stuck with a, a lousy schedule, okay, uh, for uh, summer and fall, all right? So if you need to see your advisor, uh, go see your advisor quickly so, uh, you know, you can get registered. Um, but most of you can register without seeing your advisor. It's a good idea to see your advisor, but I think most of you can register even without seeing your advisor if you know what classes that you need um, uh, to take for the summer and the fall. Okay, uh, So don't wait around because you will uh, miss the good sections, this being two of them. Um, okay. Um, are there any questions? Um, we're going to look at some more uh, inflection points today, um, uh, problems, and then we're going to go on to our last topic uh, of the semester. Anybody didn't get their test back? Gerard, you never got your test back. Yeah. Marco? Is Marco here? Marco. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Hawking? Okay, so I got all those. All right, so everyone's got their tests back. Uh, of course, you're going to use your tests, your previous tests and test reviews and uh, homeworks to uh, prepare for the final, right? Uh, of course, all the uh, if you've uh, lost track of some of your previous tests, all of the uh, test answer sheets are... Uh, uh, e either are or will be. Ex test number three is the last uh, uh, is the exception, right? Um, are, are posted on the class blackboard page. Okay, so those are important for preparing for the final exam. We will not have a review for the final. Okay, so uh, you don't get a review, a printed review from me for the final. However, there will be uh, final exam review sessions conducted in. Uh, South 405, okay, uh, either by John or who's the other person that does those? Um, it's not Leonardo. Fernando, Fernando. okay, <laughs> close, all right. Uh, Fernando, all right, uh, I, and I'll, uh, I think uh, I'll post those. I've got an announcement ready, but I don't know when it goes up there uh, for when those um, final exam review sessions are, okay. Um, but no printed review for the uh, final exam. You have to use your previous tests and sample uh, tests and homeworks to prepare for the, the final exam, um, which is comprehensive. Okay. All right. Um, so we've got a, still a lot to cover here. So uh, let's get started uh, today. Okay. And um, so what we were doing last time is uh, looking at second rate of change functions, second derivative functions, and then using those to um, 
uh, find uh, a possible uh, location of inflection points. Okay, so remember, inflection points are where the concavity uh, of a curve uh, changes. Okay, from concave up to concave down, or vice versa, uh, and that's also uh, going to be where um, uh, a function would be increasing or decreasing least rapidly or increasing or decreasing most rapidly, okay? All right, so turning points tell you where a function is maximum, okay? Inflection points uh, are minimum. Inflection points tell you where uh, the curve is increasing or decreasing uh, uh, either most rapidly or least rapidly, all right? Uh, so let's look at some more examples here. Uh, so this is homework 4.4. Let's look at some more examples of finding second rate of change functions and then applying that to uh, finding inflection points, okay? Um, and it's very similar to, uh, of course, to finding first rate of change functions and then applying that knowledge to finding possible turning points, okay? Just one additional uh, step involved, okay? All right, so um, uh, uh, last time we had uh, gotten to C in the examples, so let's continue right there, and let's find the second rate of change function for a few more examples here. Uh, and these are very similar to what you'll see in the homework 4.4, uh, okay? So to find a second rate of change function, you have to take that one step at a time. So you have to start by finding the first rate of change function, and then you find the rate of change of the rate of change. That is the second rate of change function, right? Okay? So we've got to start by finding the first rate of change function here. And for this uh, 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 formula, that's really straightforward, right? Uh, very easy to find the first rate of change formula, right? Because we're just going to apply the power rule here repeatedly. So we'll bring down that exponent 3, right? And as a coefficient and subtract 1. And then we'll bring down this exponent, second exponent there, and multiply that by the uh, coefficient and subtract 1 from the exponent. And then uh, the uh, uh, derivative of that third term is just going to be 7, right? So for our first rate of change uh, formula, we just get 9x squared minus 4.2x, right, okay, 2 times 2.1, and then plus uh, the 7 at the end. And now for the second rate of change formula, right, we just find the rate of change of the first rate of change, right? So we're just going to end up applying the power rule again uh, a couple of times here, right, um, to find that second rate of change formula. So we get 2 times uh, 9 x to the first power, and then minus uh, 4.2, and then of course the rate of change of that constant 7 is going to be 0, so there's our uh, second rate of change formula, just 18x minus uh, 4.2, okay? Right. So just as uh, easy as that. And then in a moment here we'll uh, in a moment here, we'll use that to uh, 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 locate the uh, 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 possible inflection points on the graph of this uh, curve, 3x cubed minus uh, 2.1x squared plus 7x, okay? But before we get to that, let's go ahead and look at a few more examples of finding uh, the second derivative, all right? All right, so this one's going to be a little bit trickier. Uh, because this is not just a, a straightforward polynomial function. This is e to the 3x, okay? And so let's see, what is the first rate of change of e to the 3x? Well, you know, when you have an exponential function like this one, right, a base raised to a power, okay, you know that when you find the rate of change, uh, 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 it's just going to repeat, right, the... Um, the exponential function, correct? Okay, so the first rate of change here is going to involve e to the 3x, but it's not going to be just e to the 3x by itself, right? Because here's where the chain rule is going to come into play, okay? Don't forget, you also then have to multiply by the rate of change of that exponent, all right? So please, on the test, don't forget to do that, okay? So in finding the rate of change of e to the 3x, we just repeat e to the 3x, and then we have to multiply by the rate of change of 3x. 
see if that were just x then the rate of change would just be one so you wouldn't notice that but here since the exponent is 3x uh, we're going to mul uh, multiply by uh, 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 here a factor that we will notice right in our result uh, we have to multiply there by 3 correct so we end up here with let me write the 3 in front just 3 e to the 3x that's the first uh, rate of change function all right so on the test on next Wednesday a week from Wednesday that's what you're going to forget to do is apply the chain rule and um, you know you're going to miss points for that right okay so please try to avoid making uh, that mistake okay uh, so there's something to remind yourself of on your index card right okay now we're not really interested that much in this problem in the first rate of change function right what we're interested in is the second rate of change formula okay so uh, what's the second rate of change so now we're taking the rate of change of 3 e to the 3 x and so well we just have to uh, uh, repeat this process right so the rate of change is going to have in it 3 e to the 3 x okay but then again don't forget you have to multiply by the rate of change of the exponent there again right which is 3 so you're going to have to multiply in 3 here a second uh, time so we end up here with uh, actually altogether 9 e to the 3 x for the second uh, rate of change or the second derivative of um, this function okay all right so uh, that chain rule is kind of tricky it's easy to overlook but very important because it uh, you know is going to make a significant difference to your uh, uh, answer all right so what about now for uh, this function g right so what about its first rate of change well we're just going to look uh, one term at a time right so we're going to find the rate of change of e to the 3x and then the rate of change of uh, natural log of x all right so we just found the rate of change of e to the 3x right uh, in the uh, uh, first problem I mean in, in part D right so we know the rate of change of this is going to be 3 e to the 3x so let me just repeat that 3 e to the 3x because I just did that okay and of course you all, you all know what the rate of change of the natural log function is right that's going to be what 1 over x right so here we end up with 3 e to the 3x minus uh, 1 over x all right okay unfortunately we we cannot stop there because now we want the second derivative uh, as well all right now we really need to do a little bit of um, rewriting of this formula before we attempt to find the second derivative uh, it's not the first term here that's bothering me it's this term okay uh, I need to ultimately here find the rate of change of 1 over x and it would be much easier for me to find the rate of change of 1 over x if I write that as an exponent okay so how can you write 1 over x as a power uh, not 1 to the minus x but you got it backwards Zaman x to the negative 1 right okay <clears throat> so we're gonna write that as x to the minus 1 power remember when you raise a quantity to the minus 1 power that just takes the reciprocal of that quantity right so x to the minus 1 is the same as 1 over x the reason I want to write it like that is now I can find the rate of change of x to the minus 1 just by applying the power rule you see okay uh, when I'm looking at it in this form it's kind of tricky to figure out what the rate of change function is going to be right but when I see it written as a power I know oh yeah I just use the power rule here to find uh, the rate of change of x to the minus 1 all right okay so now let's do that so we already found now the rate of change of 3 e to the 3 x right remember we did that in the previous example so I know that when I find the rate of change of 3 e to the 3 x I'm going to end up with 9 e to the 3 x right so let's write that in 9 e to the 3 x and now I've got to find the rate of change of that x to the minus 1 power so you'll bring the minus 1 down right and that will multiply by the this minus so you end up with two minus signs right so be careful about the double negative there and then times x to what power zero. not zero I mean, negative, two. negative two right because you're subtracting right okay so we end up with minus one times minus x to the minus two well that's really convenient because the double negative now will cancel each other so you end up with plus x to the minus two power and 
what is uh, plus x to the minus 2 power better known as? I think you would know that as what? Yeah, right, 1 over x squared, right, okay. So we have 9 e to the 3x plus 1 over x squared, okay. Remember, the sign of the exponent, right, doesn't affect that plus at all, right, so don't let those start interacting with each other, okay. Uh, the sign of the exponent has to do with uh, turning this into a reciprocal. It doesn't affect the sign of the coefficient. So you end up with plus 1 over x squared there, okay. <clears throat> Just that easy, all right? Um, so remember, when you've got uh, uh, things like 1 over x, right, uh, you can rewrite that with a power, a negative power, and then much easier to find the rate of change because you can then apply the power rule, okay? Let's look at this one. This one's also going to involve, involve the power rule. So let's see, what would the first derivative be? Well, you know, let's see, we're going to use the power rule, right? So we're going to bring the 3 down in front. So we'll have 3 times what? 4 minus 2x to what power? 2. 2, right, okay? But now here's where that dirty old chain rule comes in, right? Because now you have to remember to finish this off by multiplying by the rate of change of what's inside the parentheses here, okay? And what is the rate of change of 4 minus 2x? It's negative 2, right, yeah, okay? So we have to also multiply here in at the end a minus 2. See, when you have an expression raised to a power, the chain rule says, okay, you can apply the power rule, so just bring the exponent down and subtract 1 from it, but then you've got to multiply by the rate of change of uh, uh, the base that's raised to the power. So the rate of change of 4 minus 2x, that's not just 1, that's going to be minus 2, okay? So we end up here with, let's multiply the minus 2 times the 3. We can do that there. And so we end up with minus 6 and then 4 minus 2x squared, okay? All right, that was the first derivative. But now we've got to find the second derivative. So it looks like we're just going to repeat this process, right? You're going to bring the 2 down now and multiply it by the... Um, Minus 6. Would it be like negative 24? For the first one? Yeah, would it be like mixed up negative 6 plus negative 24? Why do you want to put negative 24 there, Balkis? Because it gets multiplied by, you can factor it out. Uh, no, you, oh, you want to multiply the minus 6 in? Yeah, unfortunately, you cannot do that because of the exponent, okay? Remember, the order of operations says, uh, exponents come before multiplication, right? So you would have to expand this exponent first, multiply 4 minus 2x times 4 minus 2x before you can multiply the minus 6 in, okay? We won't have that problem in this second derivative, though, because what's going to happen to the exponent? It's going to become 1, you see, okay? So you'll end up with 2 times a minus 6 times 4 minus 2x to the first power, right? to the first power, so you can just, you don't even have to write that first power anymore. But then don't forget, you've still got to multiply in the rate of change of 4 minus 2x. That's the easiest thing to forget. And we already said, oh, the rate of change of 4 minus 2x is minus 2. So you end up with one extra factor there of minus 2. Now we can multiply all these coefficients together. We have 2 minus 6. And then another, another minus 2, so that's going to end up, that's going to be 24, right? So we end up with positive 24 and then times 4 minus 2x. And see, now, Balkis, you can multiply the 24 in to the 4 minus 2x because it's just raised to the first power. But there's no real reason to do that either, okay? You can just leave it in this factored form, okay? That's fine. So there's your second rate of change, 24 times 4 minus 2x. Minus 2 times 2 is negative 4 times negative 6 is positive uh, 24 there, okay? See, so I think I've got one more, one more, two more examples here. Let's do the, 
let's uh, I think the H example is easier than the G example so let's do this one first okay so that one is just an exponential function again but the base is not um, E okay the base is 1.05 so we know how to do that though right so G prime of X is going to be 7 times you just repeat the 1.05 to the X power but then what do you have to multiply in because the base is not uh, E? The natural log, right. So you have to multiply in here the natural log of 1.05, whatever that is. Okay, that's going to be some weird fraction, all right, or some weird decimal. Here now, you're wondering, you may be wondering, what about the chain rule? You can apply the chain rule here, but it's not going to make any difference. You can apply the chain rule and multiply by the rate of change of X, but what is the rate of change of X? One. So multiplying in by one there, you see, is not going to uh, change your answer at all. Okay. So you can think of applying the chain rule here, but it's really not necessary since x has such a simple uh, rate of change. All right. That's the first rate of change, and now the second rate of change looks like um, we're going to get all of this repeated. Seven times 1.05x times the natural log of 1.05 and then I have to remember since this was not an E base I have to multiply in again the natural log of 1.05 so notice I get two factors of 1.05 a uh, natural log of 1.05 there okay well you can use your calculator to get an estimate for the natural log of 1.05 and then multiply that times itself uh, if you want a decimal approximation for this uh, rate of change, the second rate of change, but you can also leave it in this form, okay? Uh, this is fine as well. So it looks kind of ugly there because we have all those uh, extra natural log of 1.05s multiplied in. But those are just numbers, those are just constants, so it's not as bad as it looks. <laughs> All right now let's try the now let's try the last one. I think the reason this was bad is because um, the second rate of change is going to get kind of messy here. This is one now where you're going to apply we're going to really apply all of our skills. All right, so to find the first rate of change, that's an exponential function, right? Just you have that base e raised to a power. So we know in the rate of change, we're going to get the function repeated. So we get uh, 3 times e to the x squared repeated, but then we have to multiply in something else. Not the natural log of e, okay, because the natural log of e is just 1, all right? So that's not what we're going to multiply in here, all right? What we have to apply is the chain rule and multiply in the rate of change of x squared, what is the rate of change of x squared? 2x, right. So we have to multiply in here at the end a 2x. Now, if I want to, which I do, I'm going to take the 2x and multiply it by the 3, so I get 6x e to the x squared. So look, if we were going to stop right there, that would be nice, okay? But unfortunately, I have to go one extra step. So, because I've got to find the second rate of change. All right, to find the second rate of change here, what rule are you going to have to use? You're going to have to use the chain rule, because we had to use that in the first derivative, but there's one other rule we have to use here. It's the product rule, okay? You've got to think of this as 6x, that function, times e to the x squared, okay? If that were just 6 times e to the x squared, you wouldn't have to worry about the product rule, okay? But since this is 6x times e to the x squared, we have to use the product rule. All right, so can we remember the product rule? What does the product rule say? You take what? the So you've got two functions multiplied together, right? How do you find the rate of change of the product of two functions? What do you do? Can I remember the product rule? So this is the homework uh, 3.5, okay, that y'all are working on. 
Or did y'all no, y'all finished that, right? So now y'all should know this, right? So how do I find the rate of change here? Right, yeah, I'm thinking of this as gx times h of x, right, where g of x is 6x, and h of x is e to the x squared, right? So the product rule says what? You take the rate of change of this one times the second one, right? So what's the rate of change of 6x? 6, right. So it's just 6 times e to the x squared, right? And then plus, and then what do you do for the second half here? You keep the g, right, which is 6x, and then you multiply by the rate of change of what? The e to the x squared, right? Okay. So what is the rate of change of e to the x squared? So how do we find the rate of change of just plain old e to the x squared? Well, you, that's an exponential function, right? So you repeat it, correct? So you repeat it, and then we have to finish this off by multiplying in by what? Yeah, the rate of change of x squared. What's the rate of change of x squared? 2x. Ooh, wow, so we get a really ugly looking rate of change function here. I'm going to multiply the 6x times the 2x, so that gives me 12x squared times e to the x squared. Yeah, that's, that's about as tricky as they get, right? Okay, because after we found the first rate of change, unfortunately, the product rule comes into play. Okay, so rate of change of 6x, which is 6, times e to the x squared, plus then the 6x times the rate of change of e to the x squared, which is e to the x squared times uh, 2x. Notice this is a case now where usually, well, I don't know if it's usually, but often when you're finding these uh, uh, first and second rate of change formulas, your formula gets simpler. Okay, but here's a case where the formula gets progressively more complicated. Okay, notice you started off with this rather simple looking 3 times e to the x squared, and by the time you got to the second rate of change, it got really complicated, right? Okay, sometimes that happens. <clears throat> the second rate of change is more complicated than the original uh, function. All right, so um, now. Uh, uh, that's all just the uh, algebra of finding these uh, second rates of change. But again, the way we apply the second rate of change is to help us um, find inflection points. Okay, so that's the that's the value of the second rate of change is it helps us locate possible inflection points. So let's try that on a couple of examples here. Let's take these two, okay, and uh, let's see if we can uh, find the uh, uh, coordinates of the possible inflection points, and then we'll, we'll look at the graph of the curve and actually verify if those really were inflection points or not, okay? So that's what I want to do. I want to find the coordinates of possible uh, inflection points, okay? When I say coordinates now, be careful, I want the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate. So I want, I want both the first coordinate and the second coordinate. So I want a point. An inflection point is a point. So I want its, both of its coordinates, its, its first coordinate and its second uh, coordinate. Okay. And then we'll look at the graph and see, is that possible inflection point, is that really an inflection point? Okay. And we can tell from the graph. Uh, uh, whether it really is an inflection point or not. Okay. So remember, again, the way this works is to find those possible inflection points, you just take the second rate of change function and you set it equal to zero. The, flect the inflection points, the possible inflection points occur where the second rate of change is zero. The turning points occur where the first rate of change is zero. The inflection points occur where the second rate of change is zero. All right. So it's a very simple rule to remember. Turning points correspond to first rate of change. 
inflection points correspond to second rate of change. Okay. If you can remember that from uh, your calculus class, that would be really good. Okay. All right. Hope you remember more than that, but uh, that's a key piece of information. Two key pieces of information to remember there. All right. Okay. So to find those possible inflection points, I'm not really interested in the turning points in this example. But we've got to have the second rate of change formula. Okay. So uh, I think I already did that though for this one. Let's see if we can remember what it was. What was the? Um, let's scroll back up here. Where was that? way up here. Is that it? There it is. Okay. So oh, it didn't turn out too bad, right? It was just 18x minus 4.2, right? Okay. There was the formula for the second rate of change. So let's write that down. I'm skipping over some of my examples. Okay. So I've almost I've already forgotten it. What, it was 18x minus 4.2, right? Okay. That was the, so I hope we did that right. That was the second rate of change. Okay, and again, what we do is we're going to set that to zero. We're interested in what values of x make that second rate of change zero, because that is where our possible inflection points are located at. So just set this to zero and solve that equation, and hopefully that's an easy equation to solve. Uh, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not, but in this case, that should be a pretty easy equation to solve because it's just 18x to the first power, right? So I think I can solve that one without too much work. Um, just add 4.2 to both sides. So I get 18x is 4.2. So I'm not going to come out with a really pretty solution, but nevertheless, I can do it. We end up here with 4.2 divided by 18, and what is that approximately? 0 0.233, etc. Okay, so let's write down three decimal places. That's probably sufficient. All right, so there is where we think the x coordinate of our possible inflection point is at um, 0 0.233. Okay. So remember now, I want the coordinates of the possible inflection point. So I just don't want the x coordinate. I want the y coordinate as well. So th this is the x coordinate is 0 0.233, right? So how do you find the y coordinate? Well, you have to do a little bit of extra work, right? But it's just arithmetic. All you're going to do is take that point 233, right? And plug it into your function formula. So in other words, I'm going to calculate h of 0.233. I'm going to take that and plug it back in to my original function formula. Don't plug it back in. This is a mistake students always make. Don't plug it back in here. Okay. There's no reason to plug it back in there because if you plug it back in there, what are you going to get? You're going to get 0, right? Okay. Plug it back into the original function formula. Remember, we want a point on the graph of the original function, okay? Not a point on the graph of the second derivative, all right? So take the point 2, 3, 3 and plug it back in here, and that's how you get your uh, uh, second coordinate, right? Okay, so, uh, 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 so a little bit of arithmetic you have to carry out. Um, and then, so we'll do that in just a second. And then we have to actually make a graph and let's verify, let's verify that this really is an inflection point because sometimes these possible inflection points, they really turn out to not be authentic inflection points, okay? Um, uh, that happens from time to time, okay? So let's actually make a graph of 3x cubed minus 2.1x squared plus 7x and let's look at it and see is that possible inflection point, if that really was an actual uh, inflection point. So um, I, I, I've already made a graph of this one if I can find it here. Oh, wait, uh, okay. Let me see if that's the one. That's it, right? 3x cubed minus 2.1. Uh, x squared plus 7x, okay, and 
uh, is there really an inflection point right there at uh, 0.233? Let's see if we can find 0.233. That's about right here, isn't it? Is that about 0.233? And I'm having a hard time making decimals. To, uh, did it tell me the coordinate of that point? Yeah, it's right about, here's one, okay? So 0.233 is right about right there, okay? And is that is that really an inflection point? Hmm? Okay, so, yeah, so that's, uh, uh, this one is very subtle, Okay, so you have to look very careful. Remember, what distinguishes an inflection point? What changes at, at an inflection point? The concavity. So look o look here over on the look here over on the left hand side of the curve. What's the shape of that curve? Is it concave up or is it concave down? It's concave down. Very not very much, right? Okay, but that one is slightly the left part of the curve, right? Is slightly bent downwards. But look over here on the right-hand side of the curve. What is the concavity of the right-hand side? That's concave up, right? See, that is slightly bent upwards, right? Okay, so you did switch from going bent down to bent up, okay? And that it, it happened right about there, and we know where that is, right? That is at point 0.233, right at the inflection point, okay? So, Zaman, it really was an inflection point. No, no, inflection points are not turning points. Yeah, okay. Like, if you have a turning point, then, like, turning point will be right here. So that... <laughs> yeah, if you have, uh, no, 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 what you're saying is, is correct, but uh, you, have, you're, you have to think of it a little bit more subtly, okay? Um, you're saying, don't I have to have uh, 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 some turning points there for the concavity to change, okay? That makes it more obvious, but it doesn't have to happen. Okay, so Zaman's wondering, gee, won't I have some, shouldn't I have a picture like this, right? Okay, and so, you know, I would have an inflection point maybe right there, correct? Okay, uh, if you have a turning point, that makes the concavity a lot more obvious, right? Okay, this is very definitely concave what? Down, and this is very definitely concave what? Up, right. So a turning point will really help you uh, see the concavity, but you don't have to have a turning point, okay? You do not have to have a turning point, all right? And here's a perfect example of it, okay? We don't have a turning point on this curve. At least I don't see one, right? So I don't think it's there, but we do have an inflection point, okay? Because this one is very slightly, this part's very slightly bent down, and this part is very slightly bent up. So indeed, it does change its concavity, and it must change right there at x equal 0.233, okay? Uh, we already discovered it had to be at x equal 0.233. So it really is an inflection point. Let's see, what is the y coordinate of that? Um, I can figure that out, by the way, on Desmos. Um, let me type that in, because I want h of, what is it, 0.233, right? And so um, it turns out to be 1.55, okay? Desmos is really nice. Actually, yeah, 1.55, right? Or 1.555 if you round off to uh, three decimal places there. Okay. So uh, the second coordinate of that inflection point is about um, 0.155. Okay. That looks about right. There's one. So it's somewhere between one and two. So that inflection point right about right. Uh, there, okay? But we know exactly its location. We don't have to eyeball it. It's 0.233 and 1.555, okay? At least that's what uh, Desmos is telling me. Let's write that in in our notes, okay? So this is 0.233 and 1.555 if I round it off to uh, three decimal places. And that's not just a possible inflection point. We can see, oh yeah, that really is an inflection point. So I can take off the word possible there. That really is an inflection point because I can see the con that the concavity does change there right at that point. Okay. All right. Here is the, um, here is the next question I want to answer about that particular inflection point. Okay. What kind of inflection point is that? Is that where the curve is increasing most rapidly or least rapidly? Or is that where the curve is decreasing, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, decreasing most rapidly or least rapidly? 
let's look at our graph and see if we can figure that out. Okay. So this inflection point that I know is right there, is that where the right about there? Is that where the curve is increasing most rapidly or least rapidly? Or is that where the curve is decreasing most rapidly or least rapidly? Well, it can't be decreasing, right? Because this curve is always what? It's always increasing, right? Okay, so it's not decreasing. So we can uh, uh, skip the, those two possibilities. So uh, all I'm interested in is it increasing most rapidly at this inflection point, or is it increasing least rapidly at this inflection point? What do you all think? Okay, it's either most or least. You're right. Okay, it's one of the two. Right. <laughs> yeah, I get lots of. Um, uh, yeah, this is hard to see, right? So here the curve is increasing, right? See, the curve is definitely increasing. But as you get further to the, notice, as you get further to the right, it's not as increasing as rapidly, right? OK, it's, start, it's slowing down a little bit until you hit that inflection point, And then the curve gets what? Steeper again, correct? OK, see, then the curve gets steeper again. So at this inflection point, it's, incur, it's increasing least rapidly. Does that make sense? Can you all see that? See, first it's increasing kind of rapidly, and then it slows down because you have a little bit of a bend in the curve, right? So it starts to slow down until it hits that inflection point, and then what happens? It starts getting steep again, right? Okay, starts getting steep again, and so there it starts increasing rapidly again. So it's right at that inflection point where it's increasing the least rapidly, okay? That's where it's increasing the least rapidly. Think about, well, I can't draw the, um, the I can't draw the tangent lines here. I wish I could for you. But these tangent lines are very steep, okay? And then the tangent lines get a little bit flatter, not much, but a little bit flatter. And then over here, the tangent lines get steep again. So first it's increasing very rapidly, and then it slows down its increase a little bit. And then it starts increasing really fast over here on the right. In fact, it's just really shooting up over there on the right. Okay, So this is where the curve is increasing the least rapidly. No? I'm kind of confused. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's an easy I thing. I thought like, you would measure it by the slope of the... By the slope of the what? That's correct. By the slope of the... Like the line. Like the... Yeah, the, yeah. What do you call those lines? begins with a T. Yeah, the slope of the tangent lines, right? That's correct. Okay. Actually, let's see if we can. Um, let me see if I can show this to you. All right. Let's type in that formula. Okay. Let's type in that formula. So I got to help me remember what the formula was. No, no. For the original function, it was what? 3x cubed, right? And then what? Minus 2.1x what? Squared. And then plus 7x. Okay. So that's it, right? Okay. Is that the, that's the curve, right, that we were looking at? Okay. All right, let's see if we can, uh, let me see if I can draw those, uh, ah, there they are. Let's see if we can draw those tangent lines for you, Zaman, so you can be convinced. See, there's the tangent line being drawn, and see, it's very steep right there, right? Okay. In fact, there's the slope. The slope is 22.51. That has a very, very steep. Uh, tangent line. So that means that curve is really increasing. It's increasing very rapidly, right? And then notice what happens is you get closer to the inflection point. Let me see if I can drag this. Yeah, see, as you get closer, as you get closer to the inflection point, what starts happening to the tangent lines? Yeah, they yeah the slopes of the tangent line get smaller. You see this the tangent line is not as steep. See over here it's very steep, right? And then the tangent line gets a little bit less steep until you hit that inflection point, and then guess what's going to happen to the tangent line? 
yeah, it starts getting steep again, right? You see, okay, it starts getting steep. So where do we know it was the least steep? Where does it look like? Let's see. There's 7.7, 7, 7.15, 7, 7. There's 6. Point, oh, I saw 6.52. There's 6.55. Oh, darn it. It's hard to drag this thing with the with the pin. Yeah, it's not going to cooperate. But you get the idea, right? Okay. It's right there at the right there at the uh, inflection point, right? That's where the tangent line was the least steep, okay? So indeed, at this inflection point, that's where the curve was increasing. It was still increasing, because see, the slope of the tangent line is positive, right? But it's increasing least rapidly, still increasing really fast, because that's a pretty steep slope, okay? But uh, increasing least rapidly right there at the uh, inflection point. Ah, okay. So let's write that into our notes. All right. That was a real inflection point. That was an phony inflection point. Um, and increasing least rapidly at that uh, inflection point. Let's try another one now. In a way, this one is easier. In a way, it's harder. Okay. It's harder because the original formula is a little bit more complicated, but I think the curve, it makes it easier to understand uh, the nature of the inflection points when you see the graph, okay? All right, so let's see where the possible inflection points are. Let's see where the possible inflection points are located at. So let's find that first rate of change, okay? So let's see, what's that going to be? That's pretty easy, right? That's 4x cubed, right, minus 15x squared plus 14x, right, minus 2. And then the minus 1 goes away, right, because that's a constant, so its rate of change is 0. So that's the first rate of change. Still a pretty formidable uh, formula there for the first rate of change. But the second rate of change gets a little bit easier. That's going to be what? 12x squared minus 30x plus 14. Okay. Oy vey. All right. So there is the second rate of change. Still a little bit tough because it's got a square in it. All right. But now what are we going to do with the second rate of change to find those possible inflection points? Set it equal to zero, and then, darn it, what do we have to do there? We have to solve, right? Okay, so we have to see if we can solve that equation, okay? 12x squared minus 30x plus 14 equals zero, okay? And that's a pretty tough equation to solve. Uh, I may be able to solve it by factoring, may be able to solve it by factoring, but if I can't factor, I can always do what? I can use the... The quadratic formula, okay? I can always use the quadratic formula. Well, let's not try uh, let's not try uh, factoring there. Let's go ahead and uh, see if we can apply the uh, let's go ahead and see if we can apply the quadratic formula, okay? So we're going to get some big numbers in the quadratic formula, but with a calculator, we'll be able to uh, figure out what those values are, okay? So that's, let's see, our uh, a formula there is, let me, let me not do it on the board, let me do it on some extra paper here. So our formula there was what, 12x squared what, minus, what was it, 30x plus 14, was that it? Equals zero, okay. And let's go ahead and just... Uh, Use the quadratic formula. So it's going to be minus a minus 30, because it's minus b. Your b value is minus 30, your a value is 12, and your c value is 14. So we're going to get minus a minus 30. It's minus b, plus or minus. Oh, so that means we might have two possible inflection points, right? OK. Um, and then the minus 30 uh, squared 
minus 4 times A is 12 and C is 14. All of this over 2 times uh, 12. So I get 30, positive 30, plus or minus the square root of, that's going to be 900, positive 900 is minus 30 squared, and minus then, 4 times 12 is 48, and 48 times 14, I have no idea. What is that? 672. Okay. All of that over 24. So that's not too bad. 30 plus or minus the square root of 228 over 24. And now let's just use our calculator uh, to get an estimate for what these two uh, uh, x solutions are, okay? So what is the, according to the calculator, what's the square root of 228? Uh, which, what's a decimal approximation for square root of? 15.099. So about 15.1? 15.099? Yeah, so 15.09 is about 15.1, right? Okay, if I round it to one decimal place, which is probably good enough. So I have 30 plus or minus approximately 15.1 over 24. So this is approximately here, right? So I end up with 45.1 divided by 24. That's one possible inflection point. And then the other one is 14.9 over 24. That's the other possible inflection point. So what are those two x values there? Zero point six two, about, and the other one is what? Uh, one point eight seven nine. One point eight eight about. Okay. All right. So looks like there are our um, the x coordinate of our two uh, possible inflection points. Okay. So about point six and about one point nine. So we have an inflection point at about 0.6, an f of 0.6, okay? And then another one at 1.9, and f of 1.9, okay? Remember now, these are possible inflection points. And now let's look at the graph and see if those really are uh, inflection points. So uh, 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 on your homework, on your test, you're actually going to have to calculate the second coordinate, right? So that means you're going to have to take the 0.6 and actually plug it in here uh, uh, to F and take the 1.9 and actually plug that in there, okay? I'm just saving a little time here by not actually uh, uh, doing that calculation here, all right, uh, uh, right at the moment. But let's take a look at the graph and see if those inflection points uh, really are inflection points. So do I have the do I have the right uh, formula there? Is that correct? I think that is a 14 there. I just think you can't. Uh, is that it? That's it. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, all right. So let's see. We think there's one inflection point at what about 0.6, which is right there, right? Is that an inflection point? It certainly is, right? Because the concavity is changing from what? That's concave up and then changing to concave down. You like that one better, Zaman, because that one has the turning point, right? Okay. So that one's definitely changing from concave up to concave down. And sure enough, it's happening right there, right where we expected it at 0.6, right? Okay. And then let's see. The second one is at what? 1.9, okay, which is right here. That's x equal 1.9. And is that also an inflection point? Yes, because we're changing to, from what? Concave down to what? 
yeah, to concave up, okay? So indeed, see, both of our possible inflection points really did turn out to be uh, inflection points. We have one right there at 0.6 and another one right there at uh, 1.9, okay? So those really are inflection points. Now, let's see, what's happening at 0.6? Is the curve increasing most rapidly or least rapidly right there? Shall I zoom in a little bit right there? So there's 0.6. Yeah, it's increasing most rapidly. Because see, right over here, it's not increasing at all, right? That's at the turning point. That's where the tangent line is flat. But as you move further to the right, the curve gets a little bit steeper, right? Okay, not real steep, but the curve gets a little bit steeper until you get right here. That's where it's going to, it's still pretty flat, but that's where it's going to be steepest, okay? And then as you move further to the right, it starts flattening out again until you hit this turning point. So this is where the curve is increasing most rapidly. What about over at 1.9? What's it doing there at 1.9? So where's 1.9? Right there, okay? What's the curve doing at 1.9? It's de yeah, it's decreasing most rapidly, right, okay? Because see right here, it's not decreasing at all, right, okay? It's very flat, and, and then it starts decreasing more and more rapidly until you hit that second flat inflection point, and then it starts flattening out again. So it starts decreasing uh, less rapidly. So here it's decreasing most rapidly, and then over here at point 0.6, it's increasing most rapidly at that inflection point, okay? But those possible inflection points really are, uh, in fact, inflection points. Let's see what those two values are, um, the second coordinate, I mean. So this, let's try calculating h of 0.6. And so that turns out to be about minus 0.63, okay? So there's the y coordinate of our inflection point is about minus 0.6 if we round off to one decimal point. And then at um, 1.9, let's see. Oops. Ah, so at 1.9, it's about at minus 0.8. Okay. So minus 0.6 and minus 0.8, those were our two uh, y coordinates of our uh, possible inflection points. Okay. So this is 0 0.6 and minus 0 0.6. And this one is 1.9 and what was that? Minus 0 0.8? Is that what it was? Yeah, about minus 0 0.8 there. Um, for the y coordinate. Okay. And these aren't possible inflection points. Because we verified by looking at the graph that those really were uh, inflection points, right? Here it was increasing the most rapidly, and here it's in, uh, decreasing um, the most rapidly. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll we won't do the last example, all right? I think you get the. Uh, I think there's enough examples to get you. Uh, working on the homework, all right? So your homework 4.2 is all about, um, your homework 4.2 is about finding turning points, okay? So that's using the first derivative, and it's homework 4.4 is about finding uh, inflection points. That's using uh, the second derivative, okay? All right. Well, now we're kind of finished with differentiation, okay? Took us a while. All right, but now we're going to do something that seems initially completely different. All right, uh, but in fact, it's not really completely different. Okay, uh, here to finish up the course. So at first, it's going to look like this is a completely separate problem, but it turns out to not be a completely separate problem um, actually. All right. Okay, so suppose we've got a continuous uh, function, all right? Suppose we've got a continuous function. So what does continuous mean, remember? Uh, 
<laughs> okay, yeah, right, okay. Yeah, that's what the word continuous means in everyday usage, okay? But in mathematical usage, what does continuous function mean? Y'all remember back to the beginning of the course? Very simple idea. So it means it's smooth and unbroken, sorry. So you have a nice, smooth, unbroken curve, okay? Right, so let's suppose we have a nice, smooth, unbroken curve, a, 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 a function, and suppose you've got two numbers in the, uh, you've got uh, two numbers in the uh, domain of your uh, function, all right, okay, and so these two numbers, I'm just calling them A and B for this example, and we're going to suppose that A is less than B, all right, and let's further suppose that it just happens to be the case that between A and B, the outputs from the function F are non-negative. So that means F, between A and B, F is always above the x-axis, all right? So when you make the graph of F, let's suppose that F comes out uh, uh, either on the x-axis or above the x-axis, all right? So uh, we're sort of restricting uh, 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 our, uh, 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 our attention here just to curves that are above or on the x-axis just momentarily, all right? Then, uh, when you've got that situation, okay, you can, th so here's a, here's a picture of what I just said, all right? So we have a nice, smooth, unbroken curve, right, okay? I'm calling this the function f, and there are two values in the domain of the function, a and b, a is less than b, okay? And um, let's suppose that the outputs between A and B, let's suppose that the outputs from this function are always non-negative. So our curve is either on the x-axis or above the x-axis. In this picture, I have it drawn above the x-axis, all right? So the curve doesn't dip below the x-axis here uh, from A to B, all right? Then, if that's the case, of course, then you can think about the area, the region in your uh, 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 graph here, below the curve down to the x-axis, okay, all right? So, and that's our goal here is to try to figure out what is that area, okay? What is that area? I'm talking about area like area of a square or area of a circle, okay? So what would be the area here in square units of, uh, 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 of this shaded region uh, 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 that you've got here in the picture? Okay. Now, if that if that uh, if that area were a square or a circle or a triangle, right? Then we could just use geometry to determine what that area is, correct? Because we've got formulas from geometry for finding the area of a circle. Remember that was pi times the radius squared. Or you've got you know uh, 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 formulas from geometry for calculating the area of a rectangle. That's just the length times the width, right? Okay. Or we also have formula for a triangle as well. All right, that's easy. But what's a little bit, uh, well, not a little bit, what's tricky about this region is uh, the fact that notice that the top of the region uh, corresponds to this curve, right? Okay, so that makes it a lot trickier to try to figure out what this area is enclosed by the curve and the x-axis. But that's what our goal is here. We're trying to uh, calculate what that area is. See, that seems like a completely different problem, right, okay, than what we thought about so far kind of a geometric problem, what's the area of this region, all right? Now, I'm going to use a special notation to denote the area of this region, okay? Because I cannot always draw a picture of this region because, you know, you got to draw a graph and so forth and do all this shading. So that gets a little bit clumsy. So I can't always draw a picture of the region. So I'm going to use some mathematical notation to indicate this area. Okay, um, and we're going to use this elongated S here. This is called an integral sign, all right? And I'm going to put the boundary values on the region. Of course, what are the boundary values for this region? Well, the region starts here at A on the x-axis, right? So I'm going to put that as a subscript for this, this elongated S. Again, this is called an integral sign. So it looks like an S that's been just stretched out, all right? I'm going to put the B at the, as a superscript for this integral sign, okay? These are called the limits of, um, these are called the limits, all right? And then, of course, uh, one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, things that's bounded the region is the x-axis. So the x-axis will always be a boundary for the region, okay? The x-axis will always be a boundary for the region. 
And then the curve, of course, is also a boundary for the region on top, right? So I'm going to write that here after the integral sign. And now you may be wondering, what does that dx mean? You can sort of think of that as kind of like a grouping symbol. That sort of terminates this expression. It actually plays a more important role than that in this uh, in this mathematical notation. But for our purposes, you can think of that dx as kind of terminating uh, the expression, like a bracket or a, a curly brace, right? Okay, that's just a way of uh, showing that. Oh yeah, we're stopping uh, this expression. So that's the mathematical way I'm going to indicate the area of this uh, region. Okay, because I can't always draw a picture of that area. That gets that gets too clumsy. This whole expression, uh, by the way, is called a definite integral. All right. That whole expression is called a definite integral, and the process that we're going to uh, uh, that we go through to calculate the area of this region is called integration. Okay, so this is the second big topic in calculus. We've learned about differentiation, right, which is all about finding slopes of tangent lines. Okay, the second big process in calculus is called integration, and that's all about finding areas of these regions, okay, that again are uh, 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 blocked off by a curve and the x axis and then two boundary values, two limit values on the left and the right. Okay? And when you first think about those two uh, uh, separate uh, uh, problems, differentiation and integration, they seem like completely different problems, right? You know, what does the area of this region have to do with the slope of a tangent line, which is what differentiation is all about. Okay? But it turns out, strangely enough, that those two problems are really very closely related to each other. Okay? All right, so what I just uh, said to you is all of this that's on the first page here in the notes, okay? All right, so again, this expression is called the definite integral, and the process of determining this area, again, remember this expression always represents an area. The, the process of determining this area is called integration, all right? All right, so let's take a look at one very short example. Okay, and then we're out of time. All right, so here I've got this nice function x cubed minus 6x squared plus 4x plus 12. There's a graph of a piece of that uh, uh, function right here. Okay, and notice I've got an area here between the curve and the x axis marked off. Let's see, where does that area start at? It starts at, can y'all see that number? Negative 0.5 and goes up to. 1.5 on the x-axis, right? Okay. So there's an area, and you know I have no idea what the, uh, that uh, what the value of that area is, right? Okay. I don't know how many square units is enclosed in this area. Okay. But let's write down our mathematical way of denoting that area. So how would you denote that? Here's a picture of it. But how would you denote that area mathematically? So you use it again, what's called a definite integral. So how does the definite integral start? You begin with what? Yeah, you, the elongated s, right, which is called an integral sign. Okay, so you begin with that elongated s. All right, and what are my limits here in this definite integral? Yeah, so it starts at what? Minus 0.5, right? And goes up to where? 1.5, okay? And then after the integral, you can either write uh, the name of the function, if you have a name for the function, or you can go ahead and write the formula for the function. Let me go ahead and write out the whole formula here. So I'm going to write x cubed, whoops. How do you know what's going to be shaded? How do you know what's a shade? Um, you, you have to be get told that, or, or, or it has to be implied in the problem, right? So here I'm just telling you, okay? All right. Minus 6x squared plus 4x and then plus 12. And again, how do you terminate this? So you don't use a bracket or a parentheses to terminate this. We use a special notation, which is what? We write that dx there, okay? Uh, and that sort of it means, oh, that's the end of this big, long, ugly expression, okay? So again, all of that's called the definite integral. And all that just means is, okay, the area of this region right here. Okay, right? Because uh, again, I can't always draw these pictures, right? So I need a mathematical way of indicating these pictures. There's the mathematical way of indicating that particular 
uh, area. Okay. All right. So what we're going to figure out is, hmm, how do we figure out what that area really is? And what do those areas mean to us? Okay. Why do we even care about such a problem? Okay. It's not, you know, it's kind of an interesting geometric problem, but in practice, why is that of interest to us? Okay. Uh, to determine uh, such an area. Okay. So I'll see y'all on Wednesday.